Metropolitan Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and also has provided leadership for the National Convention as well. Uh, she is Emerita, a board member for Wesley Theological Seminary, and also in 2010, it was President Barack Obama who named her as the director of the education department for the uh, faith-based neighborhood partnerships in 2010. It is my joy and it is my honor to bring to you my sisters in the faith to lead us in our prayer time on behalf of the historic black churches. Good morning, everyone. Again, it's a privilege to be here in this space and this opportunity. Thank you to Anjali for inviting me to share an intercession. Let us go before the throne room of grace. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for yet another day. You've allowed us to see another opportunity to do business for the kingdom's sake. God, we pray that you would breathe upon our efforts today in dialogue, discussion, and presentations. God, we pray, Father God, that everything that we do, everything that we say, be to your glory and to your honor. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this space, that your name gets the praise, the glory, and the honor. We love you. We appreciate you. We adore you. And we live you up. It is in Jesus' name we pray and do give thanks. Amen. Thank you, Lady Counts. Now we will hear the homily from the Reverend Dr. Brenda Gurton Mitchell. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker Smith, for the invitation to join you today to just reflect for a few moments on the theme. If I had to give a title to these few moments, I would simply call them Remember. We have, a lot, have had a lot of time to reflect on our lives in these last seven months. Our daily routines have been uprooted and many of us are still standing on shaky ground trying to figure a way forward. As believers, we know that God did not promise us a life without challenges and that a sign of our Christian maturity is how we handle what comes our way. In Micah 6, the Lord is upset with his people. Verses 3 through 5 in the New Living Translation say, Oh, my people, what have I done that makes you turn away from me? Tell me why your patience is exhausted. Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and cut your chains of slavery. I gave you Moses, Aaron, Miriam to help you. Don't you remember? Oh, my people, how Balak, the king of Moab, tried to destroy you through the curse of Balaam, son of Beor, but I made him bless you instead. This is the kindness I showed you again and again. Have you no memory at all of what happened at Acacia and Gilgal and how I blessed you there? By verse 6, the people have an aha moment and express their regret by asking God, what can they do to make amends? How can we make up to you for what we've done, you, we ask? Shall you bow before the Lord with offerings of yearling calves? Oh no, for if you offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 of rivers of olive oil, would that please him? Would he be satisfied? If you sacrificed your oldest child, would that make him glad? Then would he forgive your sins? Of course not. No, he's told you what he wants. And this is all it is, to be fair, just, merciful, and to walk humbly with your God. The New Revised Standard Version says it the way we're most familiar. He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness and walk humbly with your God. The Lord reminded Israel of the ways he has acted toward them, the ways he shown love, the way he showed kindness toward them and then challenged them to do the same toward him. And God presents us that same challenge today. What does justice look like in the midst of systemic racism that is woven throughout every institution in our society? George Floyd's murder and all the other hashtag killings and abuses of black men and women, COVID-19 and all the inequities that have been highlighted in healthcare, the essential workers in education, all of these things and more 
have driven people to their knees to pray and to protest. Just as a physician can't help a sick patient until there's a diagnosis of the illness, we have to name the sin of racism to begin to treat the problem. This nation is now an open book and the 1619 Project, the Pan-African Devotional and hundreds of other resources have become tools to tell the true story of America's history. I had an experience early in my adult life as a Christian that still sticks with me today. My prayers have become pretty routine. Some of you may have had the experience of where, dear God, thank you for another day. Dear God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for life. Thank you for food on the table. Thank you for clothes on my back. And, and then, then I would list the problems that I wanted God to help me with. You know, God, make my mother get better. Uh, heal this sickness. God, help my children be saved. God, and the list would go on and on. And one day it was kind of like the spirit just kind of hit me in my head and said, stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop saying, please God, please God, please God. And just start acting and living in a way that pleases God. And it pleases God when we use our voices to speak up for what's right. It pleases God when we exercise our civic responsibility. It pleases God when we practice the golden rule. It pleases God when we seek him for guidance in the midst of whatever is going on to guide our decisions. It pleases God when we make it our agenda to become the light in dark places. It pleases God when we obey his word, when we do what's just by getting involved. Some of us won't be on the front lines. Some of us will only be able to lift up our hands in prayer. Some of us can take our feet to the street, but whatever our role is in the fight for justice, God asks us to do it, and that pleases God. God asks us to love kindness. Kindness is doing unto others as you would have others do unto you. Kindness is meeting a person at their point of need. Kindness is understanding that we don't all have the same context, but we all have a responsibility to speak a word for God in whatever situation God assigns us to. And whatever that assignment is, that we're to walk humbly with God as we engage in that society. And today we're as we wrestle with the renewed moment in this movement for racial justice, today we seek God's face for how the voices of people of African descent, how the voices of our allies against racism, how the voices of those who know that we're all created in the image of God can be heard on the side of doing what God requires. And now God, we just thank you for your word your word that comes to guide us, your word that comes to direct us, your word that comes to correct us, your word that comes to remind us that when we put you in front of all of our decisions, you will help us to remember the things that you've done in years gone by. You will help us remember our ancestors and the way they stood and whatever roles they had in the fight for justice. You will help us remember that there were people who suffered, bled, and died for rights that we now have. You will help us to remember that we all have a responsibility to speak a word for you. We're on this call because we know who you are. We've already recognized you as our Lord, as our Savior. We come yielding ourselves to you, God, today to show us new ways in this season that there's so much that's going wrong to help us not to give up, help us always to look up to you, knowing that it is from you that our help comes. And when we don't know what to do, that we will be still and know that you are still God. If we only have one prayer today, it will simply be that we will trust in you with all our hearts. We will lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we will acknowledge you, God, and we know that you, you will, direct our paths. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and ask that you show us how to act with love, justice, and to continue walking humbly with you. Amen. We certainly want to thank our presenters, uh, Lady Counts and the Reverend Dr. Brenda Gert Mitchell for opening up this 
in prayer and with a homily. Uh, Bishop, if it's agreeable with you, I will go on with the panel, but uh, I turn it back over to you now at the end of the prayer time. Thanks, Angelique, and, and uh, I appreciate that opportunity and just want to take this moment to welcome a number of new participants who have joined us uh, this morning. And I particularly want to recognize David Cole, who represents the Pentecostal and Charismatic Churches of North America. Uh, welcome to you, David, and welcome to all who are joining us for the first time uh, this morning. Thanks, Angelique. I turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Bishop. And again, uh, to Lady Council and to the Reverend Dr. Brenda Gurton Mitchell, we thank you so much for helping us into this day with your prayers and the reflection. Now it is my great joy also to bring back or uh, to bring to you our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we have some distinguished panelists indeed. I have um, brought in here again, as you can see, uh, the sharing of my screen to introduce our panel. Um, let me say a few words about how the panel will be presented and then we'll go into those formal introductions. Uh, this is a panel on unity and the diversity of voices today in light of the Micah 6-8 passage. So it's a theological reflection. Uh, again, this tension of what does it mean to have diversity of voices within the unity uh, and the oneness that is called for uh, through Christ our Lord. We have three questions from the committee that were sent to the panelists to reflect upon. And I want to identify those three questions now so that you can have them also in your memory as the speakers are coming. The first question the committee asked the panelists to think about and pray about was number one, how do we wrestle with this renewed moment in the movement for racial justice and the voices from people of African descent in the United States in coalition with others? That's the first question. The second question is, how do we reflect the themes of human and divine dignity in the context of racism in light of the Micah 6-8 passage and our understanding of faith, given the diversity of perspectives each of us bring? And then number three, how do we find racial healing given the Micah 6-8 passage and the context identified in the previous questions. I hope that you will reflect with us as our panelists come to give their perspectives on these questions. The format will be a perspective from each of the five families, which you would, I think, anticipate, uh, since we have five families represented in the CCT. And so each of them from their own confessional or family background will bring their perspectives. I am so pleased with the distinguished uh, uh, identity of each of our panelists who will come. Allow me to introduce them to you because I think it gives you some context of how it is they are bringing their comments. We welcome from the Evangelical Pentecostal family, Mr. Derek Grant. He's originally from Princeton, New Jersey, spent eight years playing for, you guessed it, the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> After his playing career ended, he established the Derrick Grant Basketball in 2014 to help players with skills and character development from elementary school age to the NBA level. He holds the distinction of shooting basketball's first four-point shot and has been inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Derek has traveled professionally to 70 different countries and has been a featured guest on television, national television that is, including NBC's Today Show, ABC's Good Morning America, and Disney's Kicking It. Derek graduated magna cum laude from Asbury University with an undergraduate degree in business leadership and also a master's in organizational management. With over 10 plus years of public, um, public speaking experience, his passion is helping organizations and individuals to achieve their full potential. He speaks to corporate, nonprofit, school, public square audiences from coast to coast. And although he is not trained as a quote, theologian per se, he is a man of deep Christian faith, who in his great demand has an, art, has an articulate voice at the intersection of faith, culture, justice, and race. 
He is active in the Heartland Church, a large non-denominational congregation on the north side of Indianapolis. I have an aside here. I have worked with that church in my past as well. It's very known in Indianapolis and calls the Church of God uh, Anderson his home. Then it is our pleasure to bring to you from the Protestant family, the Reverend Gregory Berend. He is associated with the Our Saviors Moravian Church and is located in Altura, Minnesota. His church priorities are in line with the related church community of the Moravians. In this descriptor of his church and where he has found theological alignment, they have a, just a moment. They have an affirmation on essential unity and non-essentials liberty in all things to love. They have a scriptural mandate that guides their congregational work. And that is, Jesus said, I have a prayer for you that your own faith may not fail from Luke 22, 32 uh, in the gospel lessons. And then we have Father Moses Berry, who comes to us from the Orthodox family. Father Moses Berry, a priest of the Orthodox Church in America, lives with his wife Magdalena in Ash Grove, Missouri, a small town in the Ozarks on the farm his great-grandfather built in 1871. And because they are an African-American family, the Berries are notable in Southwest Missouri for owning and living on the same property for over 135 years. Father Moses has restored a family cemetery established in 1875 and dedicated to, quote, slaves, Indians, and paupers, end of quote. This cemetery is now on the Greene County Register of Historic Sites and the National Register as well. Father Moses is also curator of the Ozarks Afro-American Heritage Museum. And after 10 years in a small storefront, the museum collection is now available online for your viewing. It has an extensive collection of photographs and artifacts of rural Afro-Americans in the surrounding areas preserved by the Berries and other families over many years. Father Moses is also a contributor to the classic work, which I may say is a major touchstone for my work, uh, the unbroken circle, an unbroken circuit, circle linking ancient African Christianity to the African American experience. It was and is a groundbreaking collection of essays. He is, along with Father Alex Achucho, co-founder of the annual Afro-American and Ancient Christianity Conferences sponsored by the Brotherhood of St. Moses the Black, uh, to which many of us also find to be a sacred touchstone in our work, as I do. And then we also bring to you the Reverend Trajigas Driscoll from the Historic Black Family, pastor of the Beulah Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And better known as Reverend Q, he is affectionately known as currently the 14th pastor of the Historic Beulah Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And before being led to the pastoral role, he served as the associate minister, youth minister at Beulah for nine years under the Reverend Dr. Columbus Watson. Prior to Beulah, he was assistant to the pastor and the historic West Hunter Street Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and the assistant director of church school at the Memorial Church at Harvard University. Reverend Driscoll was inducted into the Academy of Young Preachers, an innovative movement underwritten by the Lilly Endowment to inspire and develop the next generation of preachers and public theologians. In addition to the pastorate, he has 10 years of government relations experience. He has worked in education policy and for several healthcare associations, where he advanced the, pa uh, the patient voice into policy and research deliberation through services to the US Congress, the FDA, the CDC, that is the Centers for Disease Control, and the NIH. The Reverend Professor Driscoll is the recipient of the Remedy Health Media uh, and New York City Health Business um, Leaders. He also uh, has, um, has also been inaugurated to the 40 Under uh, 40s leaders in health awards honoring influential young minority leaders and making a difference in health care. He is adjunct professor and legislative affairs um, 
of Legislative Affairs at the George Washington University Graduate School of Political Management, where he teaches his signature course, Religion and Politics. And he too is a, a member of the Pan-African Young Adult Network at Bread for the World. And then finally, but certainly not least, we bring to you our representative from the Catholic family. We bring to you Mr. Uh, Father F. DeCarlos Blackman. He is the executive director of the Secretariat of Life, Charity, and Justice in the Diocese of Austin, Texas. He was the Supreme Knights Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board of the Knights of Peter Claver, 2010 to 2016. He has been actively involved in pastoral ministry, outreach, promoting civic engagement, and developing youth. In addition to his work in liturgy and education, he serves as a member of the Speaker's Corps of Loyola Press, the Catholic Charities of Central Texas Board of Directors, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul Diocesan Council of Austin Board of Directors, the American Legion, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, one of the historic Black uh, Greek fraternities, and is, is, has served as a consultant to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Subcommittee on African American Affairs. He is also a member of the St. Peter Claver Foundation Board of Directors and was the president and deputy president of the International Alliance of Catholic Knights and served as an adjunct professor in the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana and New Orleans. I know you welcome, I know you join me in welcoming these distinguished panelists who will come to us. So given these backgrounds, each will bring their own diverse uh, perspectives uh, to the questions that have been identified. I like to have each of the panelists come to us for five to seven minutes, which they've been told in advance, five to seven minutes, uh, around their thoughts, around the three questions. We would like to begin the conversation in the ways in which they were introduced. And so we would like to begin with Mr. Derek Grant. Uh, Mr. Grant, can you please give us your reflection at this time? Thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. I uh, see some familiar faces. I know it's been, been a year and obviously under these uncertain times, um, we would rather have met in person, but this is still a treat and a privilege. But um, I've had time to obviously reflect and with all that's going on in, in our world and uh, when the question was presented to me, I sat and thought about it and I said, how do we wrestle with something? And, and you think about other things that happen in life when we have difficulties that were challenges. And I know with me personally, how do I wrestle with them? And, and I found the, the best remedy is to attack it head on, is to have those tough conversations, to, to I like to say, stand in the gap, to stand in this place where nobody wants to, because it's quite frankly, it doesn't feel good and it's not fun. And I think for us as um, Christians, as believers, of, as, as disciples, it is our, it should be our priority to stand in the gap. We're the ones who need to say, you know what? We're gonna have these tough conversations. We're gonna actually spearhead these tough conversations. But more than anything, we're gonna come from a place of love because this is exactly what Jesus would have done. The thing that, that, that separated Jesus from everyone else was the fact that he was, um, he, 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 he went against the status quo. There was no more eye for an eye. He came with love. I'm gonna meet you where you are, how you are. And I, I look at myself personally over the last three, four months, I've had some tough conversations, some conversations that um, quite frankly, if you had told me a year ago, I would have been like, oh no, there's no way that it happened. I, and I had these tough conversations and as being an African-American growing up here in the United States, I'm having conversations with people that even I had to say, I still have to love them. I still have to love them. God did not give me the authority. He did not give me the authority to, to lash out and hate. He said, love thy neighbor. So I, I look at us as the church, as believers, and I feel as though this is our, our responsibility in this movement with all that's going on now, it is time for us <laughs> to step up. We always say in the basketball world, when it's crunch time, you're either gonna sink or you're gonna swim. This is our opportunity. This is an opportunity that has been presented to us. And this is, to me, this is, 
this is beautiful. It's like you got, the, you got the last shot to take in a game. You can take the last shot to win. You can either shoot it or you can pass it. Well, what, are we, what are we doing? Are we shooting it or are we passing it? This is the question that I ask myself. Am I shooting it or am I, am I passing it? This is, passing it would probably be the easier thing to do. It would probably satisfy my flesh. Shooting it, doing what's difficult with pressure and crunch time, is what I know what Jesus would want. This is what Jesus did. He stood in the gap. So me personally, I believe that, the, and I've seen in my own life, the best way to wrestle with this movement is to have these tough conversations and do it as if Jesus was sitting right here next to us while we were having these conversations. What would he do? I know it's kind of cliche as what would Jesus do, but literally ask yourself, I had to ask myself this when someone who was a friend of mine posted something on social media and I kindly addressed him and said, hey, this, isn't, this is offensive to people who, who look like me and come from my background. This isn't, we probably should. And they went on to let me know that, well, I don't agree with that. I'm actually, the way I was raised, this is what we believe. And even in that moment, even in that moment, I'm talking, it hurt to the core. I still had to say, you know what? God didn't give me authority to, to hate or lash out. He didn't give me authority. He, what he did say, he did tell me to love thy neighbor. And even that, not contingent on if they do good and do what you want them to do. Even when they do wrong, even when it's not right, I still have to love. We know, and Jesus, Jesus showed this better than anyone. The only way you can actually beat evil and drive out darkness is with good, with love, with light. So I, I think that the, the me personally, the best way to, to wrestle with this issue of racism, racism and social injustice is to attack it head on, come, come from a place of love and stand in the gap. We certainly want to thank you for those opening remarks and setting the tone for how it is we engage one another uh, in this journey uh, together. We now want to go to our second speaker, and our second speaker is um, Mr. Um, Mr. Barand from the Protestant family. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this morning. It's a blessing to, to be here with you all. Uh, just for a, a bit of transparency, I serve in the Moravian denomination. We're a small congregate, or we're a small denomination, less than less than fifty thousand people in the whole country. Uh, and so, it's uh, it's the context that I'm in is very important. I'm white male pastor serving in a town of five hundred people who is ninety nine point eight percent white. Uh, and so, it's it's a it's a whole different. Uh, way of life for me in, in this setting right now than I have had in, in, in past moments of my life. Uh, so trying to find and navigate through this time right now has been has been my challenge of figuring out where is Christ calling me to do? What is Christ calling me to do right now? Um, and, and if I'm being really honest and transparent, five, six years ago, uh, I was quick to be among one of those individuals that would hear the phrase Black Lives Matter and, and respond in heart thinking, well, yes, all lives matter. We need to be able to say that. And I think at that point, my head and my heart were in this spot where uh, I felt that there needed to be, uh, that a foundation for me was, was in hospitality and love and kindness. And, and to say uh, in my head, it, it, I couldn't get it quite right to think Black Lives Matter. It felt like I was excluding other people. And that, that went against a part of my core. But that, that changed for me. Uh, so back in June, days after the, the death of our beloved brother George, uh, kneeling at the corner of 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis with clergy colleagues from around our state, um, something shifted in, within me. And, and, and I've come to understand that as a divine intervention that has helped me to understand more deeply what all of this, is, what all of this has been about and what I've been what I've been blind to, what I've been missing to, and, and the, the need and the, and the hope that we need to work towards. Uh, and the shift came in the sense that uh, I understood it's not just about being hospitable, about being loving and being open, it's about pursuing one another and how Christ calls us to pursue one another, especially those who are in need. And as I stood on that corner and knelt with my brothers and sisters, I, I understood that there was a great need for my love to be pursuing uh, our brothers and sisters of color across this country completely has that's completely changed me over these last several months and uh, 
it's helped me to understand what is mine to do here in this context, uh, here locally, but also within my denomination, within the Protestant part of our uh, Christian faith. What can I do as a young white American to help people understand the pain, the hardship that our brothers, our black brothers and sisters uh, of all color are, are, are feeling and going through and, and the need and the desire for us to, to stand with, to work towards uh, the changes that are, are well past the time that needed to happen. So how can, we, uh, how can we work towards that love that pursues? And that for me, that's where it sinks this Micah passage where uh, for me, Christ is seen throughout all of scripture and I, and I feel movement and uh, in, in that shifting of how do we pursue one another, a, a message that our world needs more than ever now, but especially around this uh, conversation of racial equality of how do we pursue one another. Um, so that is, that is what I help bring to the table. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a unique part of my context and who I am uh, and helping us find voice across the board as we try to work towards some of these much needed changes. Thank you very much for sharing, and especially with your uh, openness around your own transition and conversion uh, to uh, walk alongside of the movements that are speaking out uh, on their behalf and the behalf of others, I might add. So thank you for sharing. Uh, let me just say to everyone, please be taking notes of questions you may have, put them in the chat. We will have time to entertain some of the questions that you may have. And I also wanna alert the panelists to uh, be aware what each other are saying as panelists because we also want you to ask questions of each other uh, for a bit of discussion as well. So let us be mindful as we go forward uh, with our next speaker and that person will be uh, Father Moses Berry. Father, you're welcome. Father Berry, are you there? Father Barry, I think you need to un and you need to stop your mute. You're muted at this time, Father. Father Barry, you need to unmute. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we we've lost you again. I'm sorry. Um, How about now? Now, yes. Now we can hear you. Okay, Thank you. Good, good. Uh, like I say, I'm, I'm privileged to be here today. And I was reminded during uh, um, Reverend Brenda's um, presentation a little bit about uh, our ancestors and building on what they, what they have already established. I sit in the room that was built by my great-grandfather in 1871. My great grandfather was born and raised in this house. My father, my grandfather was born and raised in this house. My father was born and raised in this house. I was born and raised in this house. And now I'm raising my children here, although they have flown the coop. But I must say that, that there are many prominent voices that give rise to action in these days. The one thing that is needful is the voice of Orthodox Christians in a time like this. Micah has shown us how to treat one another and how to speak out in the midst of darkness, which can only be accomplished through doing that which is right and just in the Lord, to be defenders. Micah says that he has shown us his will, not that he will show us his will, but he has shown us his will. We already know how to act justly and to love one another and to walk humbly. Do we have the strength to do what the Lord and the prophets have shown us? That's the question that we have before us. During the Ferguson uh, disturbance, which was about, you know, in St. Louis, Missouri, not so far from where I live, during this disturbance in St. Louis, a young black Orthodox man came to me and he asked me uh, if, if I would bless him, which is the custom, you know, in our tradition. 
And actually, it's also the custom in the AME. I'm third generation AME pastor's son. It's also our custom. I rem recall when, when my uncle passed away, uh, you know, some years ago, and my children were very small, and he asked them to to come to Wichita, Kansas, where he lived, so he could bless my children. Um, so this young man asked me to bless him to be a part of the Black Lives Movement and the Black Lives Movement March in St. Louis, Missouri. And many of my contemporaries who were also present at this gathering uh, were quite opposed to such a thing. And I told this young man, by all means, be a part of the, the Black Lives Matter movement and do it right away. However, you must follow my direction when doing so. I want you to carry banners, one banner of Jesus. And I want you to carry a banner of Mary on the other side. And in the middle, I want you to carry a banner of St. Moses the Black and to sing the guard, the cross is the guardian of the whole world. The cross is the might of kings. The cross, angels' glories and a wound to demons. And of course, he said, I can't do that because that's against the very uh, energy of the movement itself. And to which I replied, young man, uh, we don't take our cues from this world. We take our cues from Jesus. So when we march and we take part in these movements, which we must be a part of in order to sanctify this world, we must also um, take part in these kind of movements. And of course, he went away a little bit, uh, a little bit disturbed because he couldn't do it. And Black Lives Matter have always uh, mattered to me. I remember suffering as a young man under the yoke of the godless authority, which was the, the police in Jefferson City, Missouri, who handcuffed me and bound me and gagged me and threw me in the back of a squad car. This was in 19, I have to think back on this now, this was in 1965. And they told me that they were going to take me to the neighboring town of Cedar City, Missouri and throw me to the wolves. It was a very rural area and let them eat on me. And if God had not sent a fair-minded officer to go my bond, then I don't know what would have happened to me. My crime was being in the wrong place at the wrong time and nothing more. And also disobeying my great grandmother, Dorothy, who was also a, a first lady as the title goes in the AME church in, the, in Ash Grove, Missouri, which sat under a giant tree and the, with the foundation is still there, nothing more. We sat under a, a giant sycamore tree where slaves and my ancestors were, um, you know, performed weddings and where they had basket dinners and such. And, um, and, and she told me, if you keep running around with those crowds that you do, and she said very specifically, if you keep running around with those white kids, you're going to have your ass in a sling. And, you know, of course, I didn't know what she was talking about. I didn't know that she was referring to um, this, um, to the society that, that punished young black people at that time and still does for all, sometimes just for nothing. We must become people that sanctify this movement, sanctify the movement of, um, of, of everything, the Black Lives Matter and every other movement in this country. And we can only do it through the grace and presence of Christ by invoking his presence everywhere. Uh, you know, this young man also told me that, you know, that he would alienate himself from the people who were there if he were to become, uh, if he were to act in, in, a, in a, an outright, as the young man just before me, Derek said, you know, to confront it straight ahead, then he might alienate himself from the rest of the participants. I think not. I think what he would do, what he would bring those people, those people who are longing for something more than what they have into the fullness of the faith. So 
Um, heaven knows what can become of us in these times. However, I do believe that if we give everything we have to being brothers and sisters, to those young voices that are speaking out in this time and helping them along the way, because they are quite rudderless. The young people of this day, in many instances, are quite rudderless. They have no leadership. When I look at some of the disturbances or so-called disturbances, actually it's, 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 it's an issue to uh, the pain that they feel. And I see that they have no leadership. They have, they have no one to guide them. And we are responsible for being their guides. So let's join in and sanctify the movements of this world of the United States, which are taking place right now. Um, thank you for hearing me. Uh, I'm so full of passion for these young people right now who lead the way and have no seasoned uh, clergy around them, no seasoned laymen around them to show them how they ought to behave. Amen. Father Barry, thank you so very much for speaking into your own personal and vocational narrative. We we're grateful for that and for also reminding us of the sanctification of what it is that we do. Uh, we will certainly come back to you. And again, we're grateful for the contributions you have made over time uh, as well. It is now my pleasure to turn the mic over to uh, Reverend Driscoll, who will come to us in his own way to reflect on the questions. Well, thank you, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith and to the many friends that I see for this very beautiful gathering on this morning. As I really thought about um, this moment in time that we are in, this season of reckoning, I believe that it is both inevitable and, and necessary. And as painful and as shameful as it is to admit, sometimes it takes dramatic demonstration in American cities to get the attention of the larger society. We saw it, of course, throughout history and we're seeing it now. But there has been a, a quote by one of the heroines of the civil rights movement uh, that I have been really thinking about during this, this entire time uh, since the pandemic and, and, and to this movement of Black Lives Matter, and that is by Coretta Scott King when she said, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and you win it in every generation. And I think now is the time that my generation and the 20 somethings really are, are seeing but I've also come to realize that protest is needed, but it is certainly not enough. And, and some of the most impactful work have often taken place uh, that we have seen largely again with the civil rights movement took place in systems of power that they were opposing. And so while protests it gets the attention of powerful forces in our society, the inside work shows them the, the wisdom of change and that real progress can be made. And so what does that mean more practically? Well, imagine if the same level of mass protests that we have seen this summer and throughout this year and recent months with the killings of Amal Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, and, and George Floyd, if it's double that and there's a mass protest in the form of engaging our members of Congress or our state legislatures. You know, the protests, I believe, aren't just about the latest examples of police brutality against unarmed black men and women, but in some ways, whether we're conscious of it or not, I think it's about the 401 years of oppression on the shores and the centuries of murder, rape, and enslavement and dehumanization uh, that the country is really beginning to, to wrestle with. 
And so what does it mean to reflect on themes of human dignity and in light of Micah and understanding of faith? Well, what kind of justice or God talk makes it possible for a refusal to provide basic health care uh, that could have very well mitigated this crisis? What kind of God talk or justice talk um, is necessary to invest the money that is needed to end homelessness or hunger and poverty? What kind of God talk or justice talk is, is possible that makes possible the, the racializing of uh, poverty and in criminality, right? What kind of God or justice talk gives political power to denying science? Uh, these are the questions that we have to wrestle with and, and the kind of justice or God talk, quite frankly, is white evangelicism. And, and the injustice that many communities are experiencing around uh, this issue of police brutality and the coronavirus are linked to theology. And so when it comes to racial healing, I think we have to understand that political systems require theological systems, right? You, you can't have a political system without a theological system. And we all know, of course, that 81% of white evangelical Christians are a large part as to why we have this administration. And so, so, so to this question of what does racial healing look like, I think it starts, in, for the most part, with those same white evangelical Christians and brothers. Um, beautiful testament to uh, the brother, Reverend Gregory, who, who mentioned his own personal struggle, right? And I think it calls for a reckoning of that. And I think that we can't assume that the monsters and the ghosts of yesteryear will simply go back into their closets or under the stairs uh, once or if there is a new administration next year. Uh, but we need really restorative justice. I think that is really what is called for in terms of ensuring that racial healing takes place. And, and lastly, I'll end on, on this note. Um, Rabbi um, Abraham Heschel, who of course was a 20th century theologian who taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary and marched with Dr. King. He said, when I marched in Selma, uh, my feet were praying. And that dovetails well, I think, with what Frederick Douglass said. When I prayed and I prayed for, for 20 years, but I received no answer until I prayed with my feet. And so we have to pray with our vote. But it also goes beyond the vote. I think there has to be engagement beyond electoral politics. And that's what justice is, right? Once the vote is over and once November is over, we have to uh, continuously engage with our, our lawmakers and with those throughout the congressional year and throughout the year of the general assemblies. And so then what does faith really look like? And what does love and doing mercy looks like? It, it looks like speaking truth to power. It looks like loving my enemies. It, it looks like calling and naming things for what they are. It, it, it looks like telling my story and telling all of our stories. And, and it looks like um, really being intentional uh, about the conversations that we, we must have. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Reverend Driscoll, for your reflections. And to remind us that uh, sometimes the separation between movement and sanctification or prayerful life uh, do come together for many uh, when they are in the public square. That is not just relegated to, if you will, the guild, uh, to only be, quote, the ecclesial space, but there is this idea of the okamene, the whole inhabited earth, uh, to which all are accountable uh, as uh, we remind, are reminded in the Psalter, for example. So thank you for those reminders and also for the uh, memory of uh, Coretta Scott King and others that you have named, like Frederick Douglass, 
who, by the way, was an African Methodist Episcopal Zion leader as well, and that often people forget that about him and the pastoral life of even the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, now I would like to pass the baton on uh, to our uh, to our next speaker, who has asked me to introduce him as quote De Carlos Blackman quote, and just wants to remind us that he's simply a humble worker in the vineyard of the Lord. So please, you are welcome to come to us at this time. Thank you so much. Recently, 2018, the United States bishops published a pastoral letter against racism, Open Wide Our Hearts. And in Open Wide Our Hearts, the document encourages us to find inspiration in the words of the prophet Micah, to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with God. Committing to doing justice, loving goodness, and walking with God should illustrate by our very lives that life in Christ is a life of active witness. Living the life of active witness illustrates that we are doers of the word and not just hearers only, for we know faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Each of us, by virtue of our baptism in the faith, is a member of the people of life sent to evangelize the world. If we believe that the application of the gospel values to real situations is an essential work of the Christian community, then we propose that tackling racism should, well, must be done within the framework of the gospel of life. Doing so will serve us well in expressing in a very pointed way that there is no place for racism in the human heart. There is no doubt that we will come into contact often with people who will get what I characterize as the dumb brain when it comes to a definition of racism. While many people will get that dumb brain and they may hold varying definitions of racism, we propose that we consider a key explanation from the pastoral letter. Racism arises when either consciously or unconsciously a person holds that his or her own race or ethnicity is superior and therefore judges persons of other races or ethnicities as inferior and unworthy of equal regard. When this conviction, when this attitude leads individuals or groups to exclude, to ridicule, to mistreat, to unjustly discriminate against people on the basis of race or ethnicity, it is indeed sinful. Racist acts are sinful because they violate justice. They reveal a failure to acknowledge the human dignity of the persons offended, to recognize them as the neighbors Christ calls us to love. So again, when we commit to do justice, when we commit to love goodness, when we commit to walk with God, our lives should always reflect a life of active witness. When considering how do we wrestle with this renewed movement, I think we seek to make it more than just a renewed movement, but rather an ongoing, more united effort from this point forward. The different thing about our current circumstances is that there seems to be more support across racial lines to address and overcome racism. Now that the coalition seems to be stronger, we must act to achieve more racial justice. We cannot simply fall into the temptation to be pastoral leaders who simply stand before our people and pray for change. We need to place action with our prayers because with God's grace, we know we are stronger. As we reflect the themes of human divine divinity and racism, considering Micah 6.8, obviously our racial harmony and union and unity among the children of God is a good, an intrinsic good shown to us by God. Faith makes this truth 
proclamation to all people. And we are called to embody this good in our very actions. We must believe in the goodness of all, even those who disagree with us. We must presume the good because faith and the good of each person demand that we actively seek the conversion of hearts of those who disagree with us. It is in this way we reflect the truth of Micah 6, 8. We are called to remind each other that when living a life rooted in goodness for all people, we make incarnate the epitome of authentic Christian teaching in the here and now. Recently in the Catholic Church in the United States, share the journey, the fifth encounter of Hispanic and Latino Catholics, and the ad hoc committee against racism remind us of our responsibilities, not only to encounter those who are migrants and refugees, those who are on the peripheries, and those whose prejudices, but also to bring glad tidings to the poor, liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind. An essential element of our faith, our teaching is based on and inseparable from our understanding of human life and human dignity. This will help the Christian faithful to grow in faith, hope, and love, better to celebrate our diversity as a sign of the Holy Spirit. I think we find racial healing by searching for and establishing a firmer foundation for our interactions with one another. I think the firmest foundation for our interactions with one another is respect for the life and dignity of each person. As we find ourselves sailing on this stormy sea of racism, discrimination, intolerance, and marginalization in the church and society, we propose that we stand up and speak up to help pilot our churches in the United States to sail towards Christ, our hope. We are the church, and we are being called during this time and in this place to convey a compelling message appealing to the conscience of all Americans that there is no place for racism in the human heart. If we can establish this respect as the foundation for our interactions, praise be to God, racial healing will follow. And thank you so much for your interventions and the reminder of the biblical and theological principles and foundation in which we are to walk together, uh, again, within the diversities amongst the faithful, as well as in an aspiration of unity and, and what that all means. So thank you so much for giving your observations uh, for this time. Now we would like to have, as said earlier, each of the panelists to respond to each other. And the way in which we would like to proceed with this task is to have each panelist speak to at least one other panelist or an idea or both, the idea and who the other panelists would be, or at least direct their question to one of the other panelists of the question they would like to ask of that panelist for further clarification or for a question. And so we're going to ask uh, Reverend Baran to begin this uh, approach to our time together. And then we're going to ask Reverend Driscoll to follow. And then we're going to ask Mr. Grant if he would be, uh, if he would be willing to, to, uh, to follow. Uh, and then we're going to ask Father Barry. And then we're going to ask uh, Mr. Blackman in that order to follow uh, that approach to the discussion. And if you could just go ahead and ask your question, then we'll hear from the respondent after you've made your question or you're asked for clarification. So Reverend Baran, would you begin the process, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brother Driscoll, I uh, kind of turn to you in this question. You talked a bit about um, 
the the parallels and dependencies of a theological system and the political system um, help us find a, a tangible step towards re-envisioning the theological system that will then hopefully help us find an impact to to have an impact on the uh, on the system, the social system of our of our country. Well, thank you, uh, brother brother Gregory, for that for that question. Um, one of the things that I, I I do with my students is I always try to dispel some myths, right? And and these myths are that religion itself, when we think about just religion, is not political, and that uh, religion and politics do not mix. Um, we have a tendency, particularly in this country, of thinking, you know, the separation of church and state, um, <clears throat> this, the, of course, what's, what's rooted in our constitution, and so there is no mixture. But we, we have to understand, and this is a, a Christian ecumenical gathering, so the, there are several examples um, in the Bible, of course, um, of political situations. Uh, even Jesus himself was a, a political revolutionary. His lynching, his execution, his crucifixion was sanctioned by the Roman government. So all of these examples that we, we see uh, in the text, of course, are political examples. Uh, it is a prophet who came to, as the text says, not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And so when we, when we use Jesus as the example for our engagement in the policy world, and not necessarily the political world, but the more so the policy world where we are having those engagement and those conversations with our our leaders, and not necessarily the, the politics of a policy ever, right? And I think we have to understand the difference between the two. But when we look at the text in that lens and in that framework, that helps us to begin to break down those myths, I think, that we might have had initially. And then I, I think that it, it, it's incumbent in, in our I, you know, I look to the more negative influences, I should say, of our white evangelical brothers and sisters and, and the Jerry Falwells and the like, who have long taken this model of engagement with policymakers. And I've long asked the question, I think we're beginning to see some of that now with the Reverend Dr. William Barber, of course, and others. What if the religious left or those Again, not using those terms, but what if people who genuinely love Jesus Christ and wish to do well by all in that society start conversations and dialogue as faith leaders, but also as individual citizens with our local, we see this happen. It happens often, but it, I don't think it happens to the extent to which it should in order for really truly faith leaders to be engaged and to have the conversation and meaningful conversations about policy and how that benefits or harms our congregants. And so I think at first is deconstructing those myths that we're taught about religion and politics. I think secondly, it starts with the framing and looking at the text realizing that the text itself is both religious and political. And then I think it starts with those conversations and those engagements with policymakers. And I trust, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, brother. Reverend Moran, did you have any other follow-up comments to uh, Reverend uh, Driscoll around your inquiry? Yeah I, yeah, I mean, I think the, yeah, I think that's what, that's what uh, I think a lot of the church is struggling right now. There's a lot of energy, but there's a lot of wheel spinning of what do I do uh, and trying to find those tangible steps to start working towards some real change. So I appreciate you helping us find some of those steps to start working towards, especially as leaders in the church today. And let me just remind everyone that partly is why CCT exists is uh, not only to speak theologically in terms of the abstract, but what does it mean on the ground? Uh, what does it mean for us going forward? Uh, and having benefited from forums like this, I think that's what was envisioned by the vision committee. Uh, you know, what kind of actions uh, would you take, rather, to your church or your networks individually 
uh, that, you know, we're all on a journey together, so journey together. So this interchange has been very helpful, I think, in even helping us in that regard. I would like to turn our attention now to uh, Reverend Driscoll for him to pose his question to one of the panelists uh, that he might like to further as well. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Reverend Dr. Angelique. Um, my question is to Father Barry. I was, thank you for your witness and for your, your personal narrative and testimony. But you mentioned in your remarks how the current generation and the those who are leading the protests don't have saged wisdom or guidance. And we, of course, when I say we, the nation, the world has seen this year alone, the loss, of course, of leaders uh, like Joseph Plary and C.T. Vivian and, and John Lewis and, and several others. So I'm just curious uh, from your perspective of Father Barry, what does and how can those staged leaders um, of yesteryear um, engage um, the, the younger generation currently, particularly in this sort of new movement that, um, quite frankly, is not led by clergy and, and are um, at least the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement um, were founded and started by three queer Black women. So how, how can we mitigate and, and merge that intersection and that intergenerational dialogue where there is wisdom and, and youth? Well, the first thing that I like to do and think about is um, knowing that these are my children. These are our children. And um, we look after our children and we, we don't have, have to be invited into their, into their room, but we can just open the door and come in. And I think oftentimes we don't do that. We don't take that leadership position. And we, we're, we're fortunate to live in America where no one really stops us from doing that. Because, you know, I remember being at the, at the, at the being involved with the, with the, um, Brotherhood of St. Moses the Black, which is an organization which, um, which is the, to help bring ancient Christianity to um, the African-American experience. And the Ferguson administration, we wax candles to demonstrate. And we told them about the lives of saints. And we told them about, um, you know, um, how to behave properly, because they are children. And how we how we we are engaged is that we don't even necessarily look to the to the voices of yesteryear, but we know that we are the new voices. We are the new voices, and we have a voice to say the things that you said. Um, you know, you have so much to offer. You have so much to offer. You have so much guidance to give to these young people, and not only just young people, but to this world. So I think the problem has been sometimes, or well, the difficulty has been sometimes, is that we don't give the guidance. We, we, we are, it's, it's very frightening to be involved in a movement. I mean, it's very challenging to, to put yourself on the line and to say the things that are necessary without being some sort of, as they say, Bible thumper without being some sort of a person who may, maybe looks down on these people as being less than you are. I, I have a hard time looking down on those brothers and sisters, even the ones who are lawless. After all, I myself turned 21 in the Missouri State Penitentiary. So it's very difficult to look down upon these brothers and sisters, but know that I have something to give them. I have something to give them. I have something to offer them. As um, as meager as it may be in my case, um, I have something to offer them. I have, the, I have the sage, as you said, sage leadership just from being alive for seven years. I have something to offer. And so I think that's, that's, that's what we need to do. We, know, we need to know that we are voices that need to be heard among those people, even though on the outside, it may seem like they don't want to even be, they're not even interested in what we may have to say. In fact, they are quite interested. 
In fact, they have the same longing for the truth that we possess as we did when we first met Jesus. I have the same longing for him now. As a matter of fact, my prayers, my silent prayers in my godless um, days, my godless youth were actually, I think sometimes more um, sincere than they are now. So, you know, I think that we have, we have a lot to offer and if we only knew just how right those fields were, just how much those people uh, look to us, look to someone for a little bit of instruction and a little guidance. I think if we knew that, we would, we would minister to them more readily in whatever way that might be, either, either joining in, lending a hand, giving direction. Um, I, I, I think that that's what I would say. And did I address what you, what you, what you, um, what you mentioned at all? Yes, you did. And thank you for it. And, and, and I agree, actually. Yeah. I mean, we have so much to offer. We have so much to offer. We are not empty vessels here. We have so much to offer this world. And we have, we, it's our job to sanctify the world. And I will tell you something. If we don't do that, then we will have something to pay. We will have a big price to pay by looking upon the ills of this world and not addressing it in some way or another with our feet, as you say, as Frederick and you said, <laughs> and the, the rabbi, as, as you said, we have to dress these with our feet. And our feet have different ways of moving sometimes. Sometimes we have different ways, of, but we must be active. We can't say, I didn't, I didn't do anything, Lord, because I, I was, you know, I knew that you were, uh, you know, harsh man in your judgment. And so I didn't do a thing. So we have to do something. My, old, my other old great-grandfather, who was a, a child of a slave, I was raised by children of slaves, and they had these wonderful sayings, and, and my, my great-grandfather used to say, do something, even if it ain't right. You know, that was an expression that meant you must act. You must act even if you don't know what you're doing, you know, and I think we know what we're doing, so we're even more responsible. So thank you very much, uh, Father Barry, and thank you, Reverend Driscoll, for this engagement, the invitation to this engagement around the generational and, if you will, sage uh, lines, if you will. We like to think at CCT this is a forum where that can take place as well. And regardless, that that's a very important moment for all of us, especially because we know the millennial and Gen Z generation uh, comes into leadership in very impactful ways in this moment that mm -hmm. us learning from each other, regardless of what our generational identity may be, that it's important that we find a mutual space of hospitality to engage one another in these moments. So thank you for this exchange that has taken place. We now would like to go to Mr. Uh, Grant, who will come and share with us um, his uh, inquiry with whomever he designates the inquiry to go to. Yep, thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Brother Gregory. Um, first of all, thank you for being so transparent and, and, um, and honest in your testimony. And the question that I thought of was, these, these forums, these are all great, these panels are great, but what happens when we go back home? And my question is, when you go back or what more can you do from within your church when there may be, there, there aren't African-Americans sitting at the table. And that's, that's to me when it's the most difficult, when there are no representatives, you know, for, for what the conversation or the topic at hand is. So it's so easy just to not talk about it and to sweep it under the rug. What can you do from your perspective or maybe from your church, what could be done so that, even if there are no African-Americans there because of just the demographics of you know, where you live, these conversations, these tough conversations and these just conversations are still being had. Yeah, thank you, brother. It, it, it absolutely is the truth. And that's been the hardest thing, uh, which is why I share my context because it is so important. And across our country, so many religious leaders are dealing with the same situation. Um, and so how do you, yeah, how do you keep 
how do you bring that conversation to, to, to light, especially when it's been being swept under the rug for way too many decades, even centuries, you know? Um, for me, it's been a, a lot about what do I need to keep doing to take care of myself, to keep my momentum going so that I can continue to, to press, to stretch, to help people, uh, to help people go. Um, I've found in my, in my congregation, there's a handful of folks who are all about having some of these conversations and about digging deeper. There are some folks who are just, I don't want to touch anything. And there are some folks who are pretty vocal against some of this. So how do you navigate all of those different groups in the context of a congregation or even within the grander community that I live in, uh, in the sense that I'm continuing to help press and, and, and push. And I think for me, it's, it's found, uh, found some boldness in my faith and some, some, uh, a calling from Christ to saying, uh, this is not going to be easy to keep doing this, to keep pushing. Um, but you, I am becoming an essential part of keeping this momentum going. And it's, it's people who are doing what I'm trying to do throughout a lot of different white congregations that are going to help move, continue to move this forward. So it can be a very lonely position to find yourself. And especially if you're in a small, uh, community like myself, uh, but so a lot of it, it comes down for me is that self care. What am I doing to take care of myself? Being able to have some of these conversations in 2020 and zoom with folks from all over the country has been so inspiring and to help me keep moving. And we need more of that. We need more opportunity to, to, to connect with one, one another because we are dealing with, uh, with segregated societies in many ways where I'm living in a spot where it's, there are, there are no people there. And how do I, uh, and it's been decades of, of just that separation. And so there's that lack of understanding. I help people find the understanding. The question you asked absolutely is, is through moments of education. Right now we're, we're doing some book studies. We're doing some uh, video series for the, for the few people who really want to be a part of this. And I'm pushing for those people who are in that middle group. And I'm continuing to be firm and steadfast to those who are giving some voice of opposition in all of this. Because... That is what Christ calling us to do as church leaders. At least that's what I feel. And that's what I'm called to right now. And so I think across the country, across denominations, we really need to focus on that particular calling as leaders right now, uh, remain steadfast in that calling from Christ. Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, would you like to ask a further follow-up question? Was that clarified for you, uh, Mr. Grant? No, that was that was really good, and I, I you know, my hat's off to you for because I, uh, I can only imagine how hard it is for having you're kind of playing in the middle. Where you got people who are actually supporting you. You got people who are standing saying like, no, we're not, we're not doing this. So um, I encourage you to continue to fight the good fight and to remember that um, you're not playing by the world's rules, right? You're playing by, you know, Jesus's rules. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And thank you for this exchange as well. Uh, let me just say that Mr. Blackman had to tend to his parish uh, duties and is not available to answer questions. But I would like to go to Father Barry uh, to ask any of the other panelists if they have questions, uh, that he has a question for, for a particular panelist. But before we do that, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please put them in the chat or at least let us know if you'd like to offer a clarif clarification or a question because we're coming to the close of the panelists' uh, engagement. So please put that in the chat uh, so that you can be called upon at the appropriate moment. So on to uh, Father Barry, uh, to whom would you like to ask a further question would, and clarification, please? I would like to ask the question and the guidance from Derek concerning how you would, um, how you would um, go forward and um, um, with your feet? How would you give us direction as to how we can um, be more active in our ministry, in our social ministry, so-called social ministry, which I say so-called because I think there's only one ministry. Uh, give us some direction. Thank you. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think you said something that really stood out and action, right? Even if it, even if it's, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be um, quote unquote right. But as long as you're moving forward, right? As long as we're moving forward, even if it's just a crawl, I like to go, I use this as an analogy or a metaphor. I like to go jogging 
And, you know, when you run six, seven, eight miles and you start to get really, really tired, I have to keep telling myself, just keep going. I don't care if it's a slow walk, but just keep moving. Don't stop. Just keep moving. So I think it's important that um, despite what things may look like right now, because it feels like the needle's not moving. It feels like we're actually going backwards. If you look at since um, back in May, it feels like we're, we're, we're going backwards. This is where faith comes in. This is where faith comes in because the human psychology, us as people, our flesh is going to wonder, well, how can we keep doing this? You know when we'll figure out how? When we, get, when we get to where we're going. And when we look back and we be like, this is how we did it. So I say that because I'm seeing so often that this has been going, you feel like this, if you look at it since George Floyd, since that incident happened, we're going on, what, five months, six months, and it feels like it's, it's not, things aren't getting better. We just had a guy who, in Texas who got murdered for no reason. And it feels like we're not moving. But conversations are being had more frequently, right? You're starting to see now where it go away for a couple of weeks and then it come back. Now it's staying in the news. So my point is, just because it doesn't look like it right now, things are moving in the right direction. Things are still moving, but we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, progress to make. But I just think it's so important that we keep moving forward. And here's the other thing that I've found that is helpful and. Racism, what I found is actually, it stems from insecurity. Mm. For me to have a superiority complex, I'm actually insecure to think that I need to be superior to you. So with people who I've talked to, and I have open dialogues with people who are just flat out racist, and we have this conversation, I ask them, what is it? Like, we, we, you think about when racism started, it was a myth. It was a paradigm that, well, People of this color and people of this color, they're different biologically. We're seeing, well, we're actually, we're actually not. So, so that myth has been disposed. To find out the reason why people have racist thoughts actually stems from insecurity. Hurt people hurt people. When you, when you understand this, you can look at them from a lens of, um, let me help you. I know you hate me, but you don't really hate me because of the color of my skin. You're having problems from within. And your problems within are manifesting themselves in the world of you hating me, but you really don't hate me. The problem is from within. If I want to have, if I want to be peaceful towards you, I must first feel peace inside. So if I feel hate towards you, it's because I feel hate inside. And any type of hate is actually going against God. It's directly going, God is love. God put, he, he breathed life into every single one of us. So I, when, I, when I look at all the racism and all the hate going on, we're literally like salmon swimming upstream, right? We're not going with the current, we're actually going against the current. So we're actually going against what God created us to be. So to answer your question, I think it's so important as us as African-Americans, as believers, to come from the perspective, from the angle of love. I don't care what they say or what they do. This is why I think Martin Luther King was so transformational because no matter what they did, no matter what was said, he did just as Jesus did. You think when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus was on the cross, you look, Jesus was hung wide and he still said, Father, forgive them. That's coming from a place of compassion and empathy and love. And I just know, I've seen it in my life, the situations I've dealt with, I've been done wrong by people that I wouldn't wish upon anybody. And I found the only thing that, that solved it, the only thing, the only solution was Jesus and love. And I think it's important that we don't forget that, especially if all is going on in the world, we have a lot of distractions. Do not forget that Jesus and love will always be the solution. So Father Barry, did you want to have a follow-up comment to what Mr. Grant has shared well, with I, us? No, I just want to, um, I think that we should, um, define what we mean by love of course it's well defined and i think and you're absolutely right you're absolutely right um, i don't have any follow-up except to say um, we can't let love be a free-floating word we must give it definition i mean even even the the songster the beatles say all you need is love but but there's but we must define it and i think that um, I appreciate what you said. 
which we said, you, you know, you need to teach this to your, to all your contemporaries in some way or another. And, you know, give that, impart that to, in, not only your contemporaries, but to the old guys too. Well, thank you both for this exchange. I think it's been very helpful. I want to wrap up the panelists' questions to each other with any other observation you would like to accent or give a further question to uh, before we move on uh, to the next um, opportunities for conversation. Would there be from any of the panelists any follow-ups relative to anything that they've heard amongst each other? The only thing I have to say is I'm, um, I'm inspired by, uh, by everyone, but especially for um, Derek and um, the other fellow, where is he? The one with the, the dreadlock hair on top. I'm inspired by you guys. You give me hope because I always wonder what happened to, I sometimes wonder what happened to the people of my generation, mostly. Uh, I wonder what happened to them and their zeal. But when I see young people such as you, I think myself, there's, there's hope for the future. You know, those things that we, that we look, tried to lay out are not dead. So that's not a follow-up question, but that's my impression. Thank you, Father Barry. Are there any other uh, comments from the other panelists that you would like to share at this point? Okay, not hearing any. I just want to recognize that there are a couple of clarifications and questions in the chat. And I'd like to bring that to the center of this discussion. Uh, we have an observation from Donna Grimes and then also a question and inquiry from Renee Ford. I would like to invite them both to say a bit about what they've put in the chat and then we'll continue our discussion at that time. Well, I could say pretty quickly, um, you know, and with the theme we have, I think the emphasis, we haven't placed emphasis on the fact that this is a renewed moment. People were moving from the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement uh, to today. Some people have, have continued to move their feet, continue to be active, but we have had a lull. And there's something very special about this opportunity at this time. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that this is a renewed moment. And that means to me, it gives, it gives us energy and ideas for, for going forward. We were kind of at a lull for uh, probably for a couple of decades, you know, still grieving the loss of our leaders and thinking we'd be further along than we are and realizing we have to, there are new ways, there are new ways to address this. Um, I think Reverend Quadrico said, he, he, he mentioned the legislative, you know, the action, if we're protesting and raising our voices, that we need to do this also with our legislators. You know, we have legislative networks and we need to make this an issue. And, and lastly, I just wanted to say that um, for Reverend Barron, you've gotten a lot of attention because the question, I think we can all feel the challenge that you're dealing with. And I just wanted to say, you know, with racism, we always have to look at what is our self-interest or what is the self-interest to get people to really think about it. You know, how does racism affect them? So even in a white environment, to pose that question, are you affected by racism? How are you affected? Maybe it's through your children asking questions. Maybe you feel unsettled because uh, of what's happening and you're witnessing it and, and other people don't seem to feel the way you feel about it. So I'm just saying that self-interest, it's always there. And it's not a bad thing. It wakes us up. It makes us want to dig in and get involved. Thank you, uh, Donna. We'd like to go to Renee now. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is about it's something that I've been wrestling with. It's not something that happened to me personally, but I, ha I do have a co clergy colleague. Um, live, we live in Pennsylvania and uh, in this colleague is serving as a, is serving in a more politically conservative area and his son had uh, placed a black lives matter sign in the yard of the parsonage and there was a lot of uproar and division over it and he was ultimately asked both by his church and it was enforced at the 
at the supervisor's level, uh, told to take the, the sign down. And in, the, in regard to that family and the, the way that they were processing this, it was a justice matter uh, um, tied to their faith and theology. I recognize the, the, the challenges that, that come with with a political statement like that and and some of the underlying meaning but i've just been wrestling with you know how do we respond from a faith perspective to questions around i have had questions from my church members saying well but all lives matter why do we care about black life you know wh why is it just black lives matter isn't that racist and and you know so how do we respond to these things from the lens of faith and theology and Christian faith and theology specifically in a way that does respond to that, uh, the love of Christ and the, the mind of Christ and the, and the perspective uh, of, of um, I don't know, just the balancing act that comes with uh, serving Christ in these matters, not being political. And you know, what do we say when those questions come up? I think we'd be interested from all the panelists a brief response to this question because it comes up all the time uh, for many of us. Uh, but if each could just briefly respond to that question. Reverend Angelique, if I, if I may. Yes, please. Um, so it, I, think it's, it, I think it's a faith response. I think it's an education response as well. Uh, the principle of human dignity, right, the imago dea, um, that we are all made in the image of Christ, which is why all lives matter. But the reality is, and this is where the education piece comes in, black lives historically have not mattered. And we're not just talking about slavery, we're, we're talking about even reconstruction, Jim Crow, segregation, up quite frankly to the 1970s. And so it, it, it starts from that lens in terms of educating white brothers and sisters that the, the reason why black why the slogan black lives matter is in play is because historically black lives have not right and as i said on a, another call in, or panel the, the phrase really should be just let black lives exist because that has not historically and even present day been going on and, and so it calls for, for that level of engagement, but Howard Thurman, again, one of the favorite theologians I, I love, calls for the search for the, the common ground. And he uses prophetic imagination, a space of consciousness really to, to seek uh, the inner subjectivity of connect each other. And so that really means showing up in a space that is a negotiated space of transcendence in ways that we are our, our prejudice, our bigotry, our hatred, our rage, um, and that we're able to listen and converse, right? And, and with that, trust requires truth and truth requires trust. And, but I, I think it's, it's also incumbent, I think I just saw this in the chat that uh, Dr. Brenda Gardner Mitchell said is we, we need allies and it's helping white brothers and sisters understand that saying Black Lives Matter is a way of being aligned with the fact that historically and even presently, um, that has not been the case for Africans and African Americans in this country. And that we continue to see forms of oppression institutionally. Uh, and it, it is not, and then I think we also need a reframing again where I mentioned the education piece of what racism is. We, we throw that word around so casually, but we have to really have to understand of what true racism means. And so I can go on and on, but I will cease there. Thank you, Reverend Driscoll. Uh, uh, Father Barry or Mr. Grant or uh, Reverend Brahan, do you have any brief comments to this question? I would well, just add. Oh, go ahead, Reverend. Yes, go ahead, Reverend. Mm -hmm. I just said, I think that in some instances, it's an unconscious rejection of um, the fact that other lives do matter and that Black lives do matter. And I don't think it's necessarily malicious 
but it's so ingrained in our society to think of our black brothers and sisters. You have inherited white people in this country and also we to a certain extent have inherited the idea that black lives don't quite matter as much. We already know that all lives matter. That's, that's a given. So even to protest against focusing on a particular part of that, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of what matters is, um, I think it's unconscious racism. My mother, who was a poet, once I asked her, why were there so many races? And she said, oh, that's easy. When I was a little boy of about maybe eight years old. And she said, oh, that's easy because we're all flowers in God's garden. And that was a good answer for a little boy. It's not nearly enough for man. But those flowers in God's garden that um, look like me have oftentimes not been recognized as part of the bouquet. So when we say Black Lives Matter, we're focusing on a lives, lives that need attention. And we need attention when we have to call um, to mind that our life is of importance, just like the rest of everyone else's lives are important. I think it's, I think it's not a mistake. I think it's unconscious rejection. And, uh, and tell me if that was clear. Renee, in any way. Yes, thank you. Very helpful to hear and needed. <laughs> and and we so when we so when we hear people say all lives matter, you know, one of the responses is of course they all matter. But right now we're focusing on a particular group of people whose lives also matter. So to say all lives matter in some instances is rejecting the idea that Black Lives Matter. So, I mean, that's, this is how I look at this. And, and uh, so we have to be very careful, you know, when we, when we, when we take the easy road out and by saying, oh yes, all lives matter. Of course they do. Everybody knows that. But we're, we're talking about a particular group of people and their lives are of importance. Important. Thank you so much, Father Barry. Briefly, uh, Reverend Baran, and um, also Mr. Grant, do you have any brief comments to respond to? Very briefly? Yeah, I think I would, I would just add, you know, it, it, what, what, it sounds like you're asking, you know, what's the tangible step here? What, what's, how do I respond to this? And, and, and quite honestly, you know, in, in my situation, my wife and I have talked a lot about what signs we want to go put out in front of them because we are all about putting a Black Lives Matter sign in our front yard. And we've decided not to right now in, the, in our community because right now we feel like it would create more division between us and the people we're trying to reach to, people we're trying to help step towards some of this change. The, the hard answer that I'm going to give, unfortunately, is that the, the, what needs to happen is hard conversations. Uh, and a lot of it leads to uh, someone, you know, is, is this individual or this family to be able to come to their congregation and to be able to say, this, I, I just want you to hear my shared experiences, and then I want to hear your shared experiences, have a conversation about what this means and why that sign's important to me and why it's not important to you. Uh, those are the conversations we need to work towards, and, and it's hard. It's, it's easy to put the sign out. It's hard to have the conversation, but it's so much needed right now, and we as leaders need to be able to show how to do that. Uh, and, and so it, it's, it's a hard answer I'm given, but I Think that that's what she needs to consider and that's and part of the struggle too is that if if at the instant at one level up it was there wasn't a room for conversation it was take the sign down uh you know you're you're ticking off your church folks i don't know what we do with that how do we enter into the conversation then if we know that there's at least at this one this one individual um you know, I don't say how it's, it is a tough conversation. It's an important and necessary conversation. It's a conversation I'm comfortable having in, in, in my congregations, but how do you then tell a co colleague keep fighting the good fight when they've been beaten down? I don't know. That's, that's, that's in the mix too, I guess. Yeah. yeah I think it's a lot of questions about what cross am I willing to die on? And I'm not willing to die on about the sign in my front yard. I, I'm willing to die about 
what the sign means. Uh, and so having that boldness, being able to find that, especially when you've been beaten down, self care and support to continue to lift up and, and speak against, even if it's, you know, within your own system and your own leadership, how do you speak boldly against that? Uh, and are you willing to have that vulnerability? Uh, Cause I think that's what the world needs right now to see the change. Thank you. I want to thank you both for this exchange. I want to give Mr. Grant an opportunity to speak briefly. And I do want everyone to recognize what's going on in the chat. We have some substantive interventions that are happening in the chat, not least of which is uh, our panelists who had to depart uh, from Mr. Blackman. So please uh, also turn your attention there. But to you, Mr. Grant, do you have any other comments you might like to make about this particular exchange? Yeah, I, I think because I that's this is a conversation I've been having with people. They say, "Well, well, all lives matter," and of, of course, all lives matter. But like Brother Driscoll said, there has to be some type of historical context behind that, right? If to look back in history, you can see that people of African American descent have not their lives have not mattered as much as somebody else who's white. I was just thinking about you look at. Um, the, the, the amendments and the laws and, and within our country, for us to have an amendment to say that, you know, women can vote, right? Why, why would not everyone be able to vote right away, right? So my point is, is this, is you have to see that the, the, the playing field was never started off as leveled and even. It was never that with this country. The foundation of this country was not built on that. So just as children are, when, when we raise children, they end up the way they are, because of the way they were raised. Why is our country no different, right? If we wanna look at it and metaphorically speaking, our country is an adult right now. Well, look how our country started off, the foundation, how it was raised. Here's the other thing too with this conversation. As, as, as white leaders, as white people, I want you to take a step out of your, your, your perspective and put yourself in a black person's perspective. Think about, the embarrassment, the shame, the, 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 the belittling you would have to feel for you to say that your life matters as much as another human being's. Mm. We lose sight of that. We lose sight. We've lost the ability to have empathy. So I say to you, your colleague or who you're working with, ask him, have you ever taken the time to stop looking at yourself, stop looking in, and, and step into someone else's shoes. This is ultimately what it's about to be a human being, being empathetic, stepping into someone else's shoes and saying, you know what? I've never thought about it like that. I've never thought that I've never had to say that my life mattered other than a rebuttal to when someone else told me that their life mattered. Here's the last thing. I think as Christians, we get, sometimes we get distracted, right? Jesus called the devil, the prince of the world, and we live in the world. So, we're, we're constantly being bombarded that we get distracted that the value of life does not come from earth. When we say black lives matter, that implies that there's value. Value does not come from, a life does not come, the value of it does not come from earth. So therefore it cannot be taken away. I think it's important to understand despite what's going on, a black person is not less valuable than a white person. We have been ingrained and indoctrinated through the raising of our country to think this and, and, and uh, Father Barry, you said it, 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 it hit just like that. I'm like, wow, we don't even realize it. It's subconsciously. It's subconsciously both in the African-American community and within um, the white community. So I encourage you to keep, keep having these tough conversations, being persistent, right? You keep knocking on the door, you keep knocking. It's eventually somebody's going to answer. You let these people, you let people who have these racist thoughts or maybe these, these bigoted thoughts and let them know like, you're not going away. I'm gonna put the sign back in my yard. I'm gonna keep having these conversations. This is how you make change by having just a burning desire and commitment and persistence to doing what is right. I'm afraid that is a wonderful way to wrap up. We are at 11.49. Uh, we want to thank all of our panelists for their interventions. Uh, can you join me in doing a snap or a clap, and one or the other, or, you know, whatever they do now, you know, they do all these little cute things. <laughs> Some way to symbolize our appreciation for the panelists and what they have said. Um, I do, however, want us to particularly recognize the comments again in the chat. Uh, we have several, again, uh, Mr. Blackman, 
uh, has responded. Uh, Dr. Brenda Gurton Mitchell has responded. We also have Vince uh, Gonzalez who has responded. Um, we have uh, Jim Lyon, our moderator, who has responded. Uh, and then we have, I think, um, Carlos, who has responded, our executive director, and uh, Reverend Driscoll has given additional comments as well. I would like to instruct you, some people may not be as aware of this, but in the bottom part of your chat column, where it says file, it should say file, there are three dots there. Um, and what you can do with that is save your chat, <laughs> okay? If you tap on those three dots, you will save your chat. You may not have time to look at all of it just now, but I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, it is my understanding that all sessions are also being recorded and may be available for you at a later time. So, um, oh, I see also Sharon Austin is also responding and saying thank you as well. So any other thoughts you want to add? Again, you can save the chat. I believe this is being recorded. And we just want to thank everyone so much. I think this has been rich. Uh, this has been valuable and substantive. And I like to think the committee's vision has been fulfilled uh, with the participants we've had on this morning that will lead us to the afternoon sessions. So without further ado, it is my joy to turn over the podium to, uh, again, to uh, Bishop Bambara, who is uh, facilitating uh, this morning. Thank you, Bishop. God bless. can't hear you, Bishop, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to join my voice to Angelique's in saying what a powerful morning session this was for all of us. Thank you to all of our panelists and to all who participated. Uh, it really was an a, a, a extremely worthwhile opportunity for all of us. Before we uh, end in prayer this morning, uh, Archbishop Vikan, uh, president of the Orthodox family, uh, shared with me news in the middle of the morning uh, coming out of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And uh, apparently Azerbaijani forces destroyed Holy Savior Cathedral, which is the seat of the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, just either early this morning or sometime uh, in, in the last few hours. A, a real tragedy uh, that reminds us of, of incredible human suffering that that Christians and 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 people of goodwill and all different faith traditions are experiencing uh, in our own land and throughout the world uh, let us let us hold them all in our hearts uh, as as we pray Bishop, uh, at Bishop this Bandera, time. may I introduce I'm sorry to 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 to, um, to interject here just to say that that Archbishop Viken we're probably going to change uh, 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 chair uh, this afternoon. A few thoughts about that. So okay, that. sure. Thank you. Thanks. And I want to conclude uh, with a prayer that, quite providentially, has been shared with uh, us uh, by Pope Francis. Uh, many of you have spoken about an encyclical letter that he released just a few days ago. He ends that very lengthy letter with what he terms an ecumenical Christian prayer. Uh, I think it speaks powerfully to who we are and to what we are about. Let us pray. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings of the abandoned and forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come, O Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary, different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. Amen. 
enjoy your lunch or your break, and we will see you back in an hour, 1 p.m. Eastern time. God bless. How was it? How'd it go? Good. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I like this young man. I like this Derek and Father Reverend uh, Driscoll. Diego, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for, for your help and support. I think everything went well. Yeah, yeah, it went really good. I mean, I just put some people in the waiting room. Yeah. Um, is anyone that's on here supposed to be on here, or can they all? Um, um, I don't know. It's just that they are either the... They'll probably just have it on. But no, I'm just saying, yeah. does anybody else need to be on here? Because I could put them all in the waiting room. No, you can put them in the waiting room. Yeah, they don't need to be here. Okay. Um, is there, I did the slides for the, um, for the pictures that you wanted. Mm -hmm. So I have them ready whenever, cool. um, whenever he, whenever they give me the cue to okay. uh, put them on, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I will I will send him a text to let him know that that is ready. Um, also, we want to do a picture, right? They said uh, we want to do a picture of all the participants. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. We can do if we can do that. Um, we it was good to do it now, but because we might have less people in the afternoon. I know. Yeah, I took some pictures regardless, um, mm -hmm. but some of them had their screens off. Okay. But uh, we'll do a, a picture later on. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, if whoever is missing, I'll just add them in um, manually. Um, okay. And uh, and also, I could I could do it from the video that we took, so it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, let me stop recording. Hold on. Stop recording.